We're here today with Diego Comín, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, um, and also one of our grantees here, um, with, a, with a really a very ambitious uh, proposal um, to study the drivers and consequences of technology adoption. Um, Diego, welcome. Thank you. How are you. And I've been reading your proposal, um, and it seems that you're concerned with a, a puzzle that uh, the poor countries have gotten better at adopting technology so that they've caught up with the rich countries, but they're not caught up in income yet. What's, what's this all about? So basically, it's a, it's a very puzzling finding. Um, when you look at direct measures of technology adoption, you can decompose the process of adopting a technology between two dimensions. One that we call the extensive margin, which has to do with the lack with which countries adopt new technologies, and the other... So extensive margin means just simple adoption, exactly. which just means somebody in the country is using cell phones. Exactly, so, okay. exactly. And, and the other is the intensive margin, which is how intensively they use the technology once they have adopted it. So that means everyone in the country is using cell phones. Yes, or people are using it with a certain intensity. You, okay. you, know, you may have like 10 cell phones and in other places I people see. may have just one or something. Okay. And a fact that I've uncovered with co-authors in my research is that adoption lags have become, have become shorter and shorter over the last 200 years. Extensive adoption. Extensive adoption. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, this, they, they have declined almost linearly for the last 200 years. So newer technologies have diffused faster everywhere than older technologies, like say, you know, steamboat or railways. Um, now, this decline in adoption lags has been particularly important in poor countries. So you would expect then to see some convergence in income, okay? And we haven't seen that. We have seen, if anything, divergence in income. So definitely divergence over the last 200 years. So that's the puzzle that um, motivates the grant. And um, the answer I'm finding is that the way to reconcile the dynamics of technology with the dynamics of income has to do with this intensive margin. So it has to do with the fact that um, once technologies have been available in countries, um, rich countries have used them more intensively relative to poor countries in recent times, vis-a-vis -vis earlier times. What sort of evidence, wh what are you using? How do you do this? So that's a very good question. Until very recently, there was no direct measure of technology. So when people had to study technology, um, they had to rely either on very small data sets um, that measure technology at the firm level um, based on micro studies, or um, broader data sets that were basically based on solo residuals. It was like residuals in output, aggregate output, after you factor in capital and labor. Now, with my, the help of one of my co-authors, Parho Bain, at the San Francisco Fed, we have put together a very comprehensive data set that covers the diffusion of 104 technologies in, in 156 countries, um, covering a period over the last 200 years. But you need some modeling, uh, some, some modeling effort to disentangle this extensive and intensive margin, okay? Mm -hmm. And now we have the technology to do that. You know, we have developed those techniques to separate the extensive and the intensive margin. And that's also part of my, of, my, of my research effort, part of the proposal, has to do with understanding, you know, once a, you document that the intensive margin evolves in a particular way that allows you to explain the dynamics of income over the last 200 years, uh, then you have to pose the question of why is it the case that it has evolved in that particular way. And that gets you to think about what it means for companies to adopt technologies. What are the, 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 the barriers or the constraints or the factors that push you to adopt more or less intensively technologies, okay? And, with, and within that question, I'm analyzing different drivers uh, with different co-authors too. So with some co-authors, with Ramarananda at HBS, we are looking at um, financial frictions. We are looking at the development of financial markets and how those may or may not um, slow down the diffusion of technologies in poor or in rich countries. With other co-authors, I'm doing um, political institutions, how you know, there is a variety of theories in political science that, uh, you know, political economy, that have um, tried to explain why um, political institutions um, may or may not slow down the diffusion of technologies. And a final set of hypotheses studies the, the role of geography. So most um, 
most people that have tried to study the drivers of growth across countries, they have focus on characteristics that have of, of a country. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's like rocket science. You know, mm -hmm. you have something that pushes the rocket and then you explain the, the trajectory of the rocket. Yes. Now, reality, you could think that um, factors that are external to the country might affect the trajectory that the country has either in terms of growth or in terms of technology. Now, so this is a very wide-ranging project, where, and an ambitious one. Where does this come from in your life? Why did you decide to work on this problem? How well, did that come about? Deep inside, I've always been a growth theorist. You know, I, when I was in, in college, um, I took many advances. I, I, I was lucky enough. To this was in Spain. That was in Spain, in University yes. Pompeu Fabra. So I was very lucky, and many of, of the professors I had were fantastic, and, and several of them were, were macroeconomists. And, and they were uh, people that were um, developing very actively the, the endogenous growth models and endogenous mm -hmm. growth theory. Um, and, and they would teach all the stuff they were researching, basically, to the undergrads. Um, so I was you know, extremely well endowed with, with, with growth. Uh, knowledge mm -hmm. when I went to grad school at Harvard, you know, in 1995. So you began by learning from your professors these theories of endogenous growth and, and, and so forth, um, but what then inspired you to do so much work, to, co to collect the data, to put together, this took you years and years, I suppose. What, what pushed me, I think, it was the conviction that um, the field of growth had f reached a certain plateau that had followed the you know uh, excitement um, of of the first set of growth models, endogenous growth models, in the early 1990s, and it had reached a plateau by which at, at which we had um, several theories around, um, but we didn't have much of an, an empirical footing of those of those theories. One and two, we didn't have much uh, um, that could be said about. Um, technology in poor countries. Okay? M much of the, of the growth theory developed had to do with explaining the world technology frontier and why that grew and so on and so forth. But there was very little about why is it the case that the poor countries are so far from this world technology frontier, both mm -hmm. on the theory side and on the empirical side. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to me like a huge opportunity. Now I see when you were starting this project, you were teaching at NYU, uh, New York University, right here in New York. Um, just after your PhD, and then you moved on to Harvard Business School. Yes. So this is a project that's taken 10 years and it's still going on. But I want to ask you, what is the, in your own experience of teaching, for example, um, it was between NYU and Harvard Business School, between an economics department, you were an economics department, right, at NYU. Um, what, what, just how, do, what did you characterize that? Well, they're like two different jobs. One is to two different jobs. Completely, so it's like being, yes. the difference between being a lawyer and being a doctor. Oh, <laughs> they are fantastic, both of them, yes. in their own sense. The job of the of the faculty is very different. In one, you have to lecture, you have to basically take advantage of your privileged knowledge to illustrate people that, in principle, know less than you. While in the other one, you are a conductor. You are basically creating a dialogue mm -hmm. in a very Socratic uh, sense, uh, by which everybody is contributing to it. Mm -hmm. So you are orchestrating that dialogue. And the, the important thing is not so much um, um, how much you know, but how much you are able that at the end of the day, the dialogue that elevates in the mm -hmm. classroom, it's sufficiently rich and, and accessible for everybody to assimilate all that knowledge. In a yeah. way, it's a much less predictable experience to go and con you know, conduct a case, discuss a case, mm -hmm. than to give a lecture. So lectures, after you have done it twice, you are very bored because you know what's going to happen. When you discuss a case, every time is different. It's more like research. It's more like research. So this, this has been a, uh, really illuminating uh, for me, and I really look forward to seeing the results of your, of your project. i um, really glad that we're, we're supporting this, and I can see why. Um, and uh, we're happy to have you, have you here and to, to welcome you to our stable of INET economists. Diego Comin. Thank you very much, Barry.